it's a lot of sort of theatrical, rhetorical fodder. I will not be doing this. We're not going to have to do this or this or this. Fabulous. But 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 what if you weren't actually <laughs> going to have to do them anyway? Maybe a little less fabulous or maybe still fantastic grandstanding and very reassuring to people who didn't fancy having seven bins and didn't want to tax on meat and weren't much keen on sharing their cars with strangers. <laughs> you know, they maybe the terrific speech from that perspective. I think it gives us a little insight into why this might be happening. Um, we know that in the lead up to elections, particularly elections where a, a governing party is struggling in the polls, they've got to create so-called wedge issues. They've got to create issues that open them up away from the opposition party who are doing quite well at the time. That's what's happening at the moment. And it is to many people's frustration that it looks like they're trying to make a wedge issue around environmental issues. And I think having this thing of, like you were saying there, of, of sort of making up ideas and then saying, oh, well, we're not going to do those ones. And some of those ideas we know are ones that we often see repeated in certain elements of the press and so on, essentially are scare stories. They weren't credible suggestions by anyone. Um, so it shows that this is a bit about a wedge strategy. But I actually think that there's something deeper going on here, which is that we shouldn't just think of this as in terms of green issues. We need to think of this in terms of the economy. And Britain is at times struggling to get investment in it from places around the world. The electric vehicle era, the wider green era, renewable energy and so on, that era has already begun. It's been around for many years. And countries around the world are investing in those technologies. Their question is how much we as a country ensure that that investment comes to us. And this rolling back on ambition is going to have a knock-on consequence for that investment in Britain, as the automotive industry has made it very clear over the last couple of days. So we've got to not just think about the green side to this, we've got to think about the economic side to it as well. It's also true, isn't it, that, that you know, the, the uh, diesel car situation has been among, you know, those who live within the ULES area, et cetera, incredibly unpopular. And in fact, the kind of momentum of unpopularity has been quite engulfing. And many people have said, look, I can't afford to replace my car. I need my car. I'm, mm. a, I'm a, a care worker. I'm a health visitor. I'm a, you know, I'm somebody who really is a, making a great contribution to the community. I'm not well paid. I can't afford a new car. I need my car. Oh my God, I'm in real dire trouble because of this. It's really ruining my life. I don't know what to do. I may have to give my job up. It's very serious stuff, isn't it? And actually, the, the amount of warning is almost irrelevant. If you haven't got the money, you haven't got the money. It doesn't matter if they tell you 10 years earlier or 20 years earlier. So maybe this was a blessed announcement yesterday in many families. You might say particularly, for example, rural families in rural dwellings mm -hmm. who wouldn't have coped mm -hmm. well with a heat pump. They would have been totally ill-suited. The Prime Minister says it might have cost up to 20 grand. He might be exaggerating. It might be true. But it might be balm to the soul of those families to hear this. And it might be a vote turner, mightn't it? I think, and it, it, it shouldn't be though, and I'll explain why, because I think this gets right to the heart of the issue. Um, the, the government could have framed things like the phase out of petrol and diesel vehicles and, and borders and so on as an opportunity to be exploited, but instead it's framed it as a cost to be borne or to be reduced, right? So let's just think of the EVs. The, the policy there wasn't, oh, by 2030, people aren't allowed to drive petrol and diesel anymore, kind of like massive countrywide ULES scheme. That wasn't the policy. The policy was we've got to make sure that we're not selling new petrol and diesel. Now, by saying there's a set date when that's going to happen, two things then occurred. One, car companies said, oh, OK, this country's serious about doing this. They're going to be a bigger market for electric vehicles in this country, so we're going to invest in that country. The second thing that happened is that it starts to create secondhand markets in electric vehicles. So the people who rightly, and I strongly agree with you, shouldn't be having to break the bank, buying a Tesla or anything, would have benefited if we had the earlier phase out date, if we kept that 2030 date, because there would have been more investment in the country on electric vehicles. The price would have gone down. That's what happens when we have more investment, more people buying the things. And then we would have had this secondhand market. Lots of people buy electric cars in the secondhand market. They become much cheaper at that point. But instead of doing that, instead of basically saying, well, there's a huge opportunity here for us as a country, the government has turned it around and basically said, oh, yeah, it's going to be really expensive if you get an EV. So we're going to delay the time. Unfortunately, it's going to make it more expensive because we'll get less investment and there'll be less of a second-hand market in those electric vehicles. That's why it's about the economics, this really.